Ready for the word? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Well, let me uh, pray with you. Would you bow your heart with me, please? Father, we're so thankful to you for how you love us. I pray as I teach today that you would minister to each of us in a unique way, that we would feel as if you were literally speaking to us personally. In Christ's name, amen. Last week I began this brand new teaching series that's entitled Experiencing Jesus. It's a four-week series. And so today is the second week and my subject is Experiencing Grace. The question I put to, to us and even to myself is, can our generation experience Jesus? When we experience Jesus, we experience the essence of who he is. We witness his workings. We understand him even by seeing ways that he demonstrates his character. His divine traits like his mercy, his long-suffering, his patience, his forgiveness. And today we're going to look at his grace. Jesus, when he walked the earth, he captivated all kinds of people, from the good to the bad, from the righteous to the unrighteous. And you'll find that some of the religious leaders, they struggled with Jesus because he made some strong claims as to who he was. And so as a result, they called him all kinds of ugly names, from being a deceiver to a glutton to a to, you know, to a drunkard. They even called him Beelzebub, which means prince of demons. These ugly names were thrown at Jesus because they didn't want to submit themselves to what God was all about and what God wanted. And so I'd like for us to spend some moment understanding what God's grace can do in our lives. James Ryle, a legendary pastor and author, he says, grace is the empowering presence of God enabling you to be who God created you to be and to do what God called you to do. That's grace. Imagine if you would that you had this stomach bug and it caused you to lose all kinds of energy and you had to get an IV drip. And it just injected these nutrients in you Grace is when God puts his IV into your arm and injects nutrients in you so you can be who he's called you to be and do what he's called you to do. So my prayer today is that as I preach, each of us will feel grace coming into our person. So when you leave this place today, you'll know Yes, I can be whom God's called me to be and I can do what God's called me to do. Not in my own strength, not in my own intellect, but by his grace. Grace, it's also, it means undeserved kindness. And for these next few moments, I'm going to walk you through a Bible story that shows how God's undeserved kindness was extended to a woman that seemed so unlikely a person for God's grace. John chapter 8 is where I'm going to spend our time. And so I begin reading at verse 1. Scripture says, But Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. At dawn he appeared again in the temple courts, where all the people gathered around him, and he sat down to teach them. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now, what do you say? They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, Let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. 
Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. Grace was seen and experienced in this biblical account. And I want us to understand it because there's some people in our lives that's going to need us to extend grace to them. Undeserved kindness. And it's going to empower them to be whom God's called them to be and to do what God's called them to do. But for us to extend grace to others, we must first become a recipient of grace. And so there are lessons that we can see in this story that would help us understand how grace is experienced. May I offer to you three lessons from this account. Lesson number one, grace triumphs over judgment. Jesus was in the middle of one of his captivating sermons and he was rudely interrupted. Now we must understand, this was around six o'clock in the morning. Scripture says it was dawn. And so it's just early birds, people like you, people like me, early risers. And they're listening to Jesus. He was sitting down, he was teaching. And all of a sudden, this, this, this mob, if you would, of religious leaders, they come pulling this woman through the crowd and they had her stand in front of the crowd right there as Jesus was sitting down and now they threw this challenge at him. See, they wanted to accuse Jesus. This was all engineered, all planned out. Because they had to be lurking about to see. They knew the woman was having some type of an affair. You don't just stumble on someone at six in the morning and say, oops, so we're just passing by the whole bunch of us. They, they understood they knew so-and-so, she is with this guy and, and they're going to be spending the night and let's go there. We're going to, in a calculated way, we're going to trap Jesus. Because their accusation against Jesus was he was too liberal. He was too lenient on sinners. He was too soft on sin. And so they sought to humiliate and discredit him so that people would no longer follow him, that he would lose his ministry, he would lose his influence. And so the scheme was to present this dilemma to Jesus in the public so everyone will be able to witness and see, hey, Jesus, he's, he's not the Savior. He's not a person sent from God. And at best, if he agreed with them, it would make them walk around sticking their chest out. See, we were right all along. Now, the teachers of the law, here's the problem. They were very legalistic. They thought that they were excellent representatives of God. Jesus thought just the opposite. These guys are lousy representatives of God because they don't show us God's heart. They show us just the antithesis. See, the religious leaders, they, they knew that they were engineering something because, ladies, you would attest to this. Where's the man? You can't have an affair by yourself. Where's the guy? And the, the religious, so they messed up, either had him run off, he may have hidden. Who knows? They may not have been able to catch him. He's too fast. But he wasn't there. And they really didn't care about the guy. They just cared about this woman. They had some problem with her. Because they didn't need to parade her through town. They could have placed her under an armed guard in a private area and then brought the accusation to Jesus. So they were referencing the law because in the law they said, the law says that if a man is found sleeping with another man's wife, both the man and the woman should be put to death. Why? That they may purge the evil from Israel. So this was all engineered. It was a sham. Now here's the dilemma. If Jesus said, ignore the law, he'll be charged with contradicting the law. So you knew he can't do that. If Jesus said, stone her, 
then he would be charged with a criminal act because the Roman government, government did not authorize some, per, some, some public stoning of a woman. If the government of Rome did not authorize this kind of capital punishment, anyone that creates a mob scene to do that would be instantly arrested. So they thought they had Jesus trapped. Most people like to live life in, the, in a black and white kind of way, meaning that it's, they think one dimensionally. They, there's no gray area. They look at life as if it's either right or wrong in terms of your actions, righteous or unrighteous, good or bad, just or unjust. And so Jesus, he, he's saying to them, look, wait a second, life is not so simplistic as if you're thinking, talking to the religious leaders, you're thinking that truth means that I just do what I saw. I saw this woman, she's caught in the act, let's just punish her, be done with the whole thing, neat and clean. Jesus said, no, 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 no. Truth dispensed by itself can be very dangerous. Jesus is teaching them, there's another thing for you to consider. It's considering grace added to truth. In John 1 verse 14, the scripture says, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. The word is Jesus, by the way. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only Son, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus then, he's totally grace, and he's totally truth. And if you separate one from the other, you'll never really experience Jesus. And that's why, parents, we need to understand how to dispense grace with our children. And those who are married, you need to know how to dispense grace to your spouse. And those of you who work in the workplace, you, know how to, you must know how to dispense grace to your coworkers, to your colleagues. In the educational system, teachers, you must know how to dispense grace to your students. And students, you must know how to dispense grace to your teachers because no one's perfect. And here we see Jesus is introducing that grace must be a part of the process when you deal with people. In fact, verse 14 of John 1 underscores that. It says, or go over, sorry, verse 17, for the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. So the Bible describes Jesus as being full of grace and truth and the one who unites grace and truth. Jesus extended now undeserved kindness, grace towards this guilty woman. There was no question she was guilty. She knew she was guilty. The relig religious leaders knew that she was guilty. Jesus knew she was guilty. He said that. He said, go now. He said, I don't condemn you. He said, go now and leave your life of sin. Jesus, he said, I know you're guilty. But the way to deal with you is not just condemning and being judgmental. I'm going to inject grace into this awkward, messy situation. And I'm going to link grace and truth together. I remember this dad, he was frustrated with his son because the son was not really doing well in school. And that next semester, that son really buckled down. He spent a lot of time studying. A lot of hours, instead of playing all of his electronic games, he's studying. And then when the report card comes, he had a couple of C's in math and history, other areas, B's and A's. And the father did something that was a little bit unconventional. He said, son, let's go out to Baskin Robbins. And the boy is saying, well, what, what, dad, don't you, look at my report card. I'm not happy with this. I messed up. And the father says, son, jump in the car, let's go, because I want to treat you to some ice cream because of your effort. And so what that father learned was that grace triumphs over judgment. That there are some people waiting for you to be able to show grace rather than the quickest thing, judgment, condemnation, punishment. And this is what Jesus did. And so he models this for us. Now let me take you back to the text again. This time looking at verse 5 of John 8. In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. Now what do you say? 
They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. When they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any one of you who is without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time, the older ones first, until only Jesus was left with the woman still standing there. What can we learn from this? What is the second lesson that we can pull from this and apply it instantly to our lives today? Might I suggest to you this lesson? Grace defeats shame. See, experiencing grace, it empowers you to defeat the stranglehold of shame. See, the religious leaders, they disgraced and shamed the woman. They had her stand in front of the crowd. As I mentioned earlier, they could have easily placed her under some type of, of protection or custody in a home because they had guards. But they didn't do that. And so here she is now, walking through town under the rest. Hair is unkempt, dress not placed on properly because the scripture says they caught her in the very act of adultery. She didn't have time to compose herself. She didn't have the time to, to make sure that at least let me look decent as I'm, I'm now going to be shamed, the, 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 great, the greatest shame in my life and this public rebuke. I'm now going to be ostracized from my community and I'm facing death. See, shame is it's, it's a horrible feeling. The noted Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung says, shame is a soul-eating emotion. In other words, it eats away at your infrastructure. When you ever hang around someone who's filled with shame, there's this self-loathing. They, they, they despise themselves. And they may, it sounds like self-deprecating jokes and humor that they use, but it's too many. It's too much. It's overdone. Because they feel bad about themselves. And here's this woman struggling now in the public struggling in her community as to how she's going to be perceived and what's going to happen afterwards. And here's Jesus then. He bends down and he starts to write in the ground. Scripture's silent as to what he wrote. Man, I'm nosy. If I was there, I'd be looking. What did he write? What did he write? And then the religious leaders are still asking questions. What should we do? What should we do? Moses said, Stoner, what do you say? Come on, Jesus. Come on. Chop, chop. What should we do? Jesus then says, let him who's without sin throw the first stone. He bends down. He starts writing again. Apparently, they must have read what he's writing because the scripture says, from the older to the younger, they start walking away. I mean, the old guys start backing up. Young guys, the old guys walking. Why? Some say he may have been writing down some of their sins. But whatever he wrote, it created deep sense of conviction. And I think that sometimes we shame others because we forget where we've come from. See, sometimes I think we shame others because we forget what God has forgiven us of. We forget the, the great grace of God, the amazing grace of God that was extended to us undeserving people. See, experiencing grace, it means that you're going to experience Jesus. And it was so unusual for these religious leaders to extend grace to people. It was foreign to them. They had no idea what that was about. They didn't know what to do with that. It wasn't part of their, their, their DNA. It wasn't part of their, their, their behavior pattern. But Jesus recognized that grace defeats shame because Jesus saw her as a person and not as a sinner. I remember one of the counseling sessions that we had was with this woman that was in her 40s, dressed in all the regalia of being a Muslim. And she said this, I became a Muslim 
because I saw how mean my mother was towards me, who calls herself a follower of Jesus, and all she kept doing was calling me a sinner. And I realized I don't want any part of that. What I'm saying is that when we think about grace, grace is not in the business of demonizing people. The woman had a major moral failure. She messed up. Jesus knew it. She knew it. The community knew it. But Jesus didn't look to bring shame to her because of her sin. Sin is to miss the mark and not share in the prize. The religious people, all they wanted to do was throw her under the bus, use her as a statistic, say, hey, that's what happens to people that mess up, point their fingers, wag it. And think about it. That's not what grace does. Grace says, you are a person. You are valued. Grace says, you have worth. Grace, grace says, if I can just help you lift the load of shame off of you, imagine what you can become. David the psalmist wrote this in Psalm 32 and verse 5. Finally, I confessed all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. David was saying, look, you know, my, my guilt, my shame, this self-condemnation, that I'm, this self-loathing, that I'm carrying around the weight of all my indiscretions, of my poor moral choices, my ethical behavior that's been substandard to, to the teachings of God. God, he said, I, I confess. I've sinned against you. I've fallen short of your standard. I'm not worthy of the prize. I, I fell below the mark of that you have established for me to hit with my life. And he said, when I did that, unbeknownst to me that this was going to be the end result, all my guilt is gone. This is what Jesus was doing. He was helping that woman come into this place where she can realize and accept the fact, I messed up, I blew it, but I need help. I need God's love. Because the shame, this prison of shame, it's too much for me to bear. It was anonymously said, shame is an excuse to avoid love and to give up on ourselves. And there's some people that you think that your sin is unpardonable. You think that what you've done is so heinous, it's so diabolical, that, there is, that there's no grace for you. Are you saying then that what Jesus did on the cross 2,000 years ago is inadequate because he can't forgive you? Are you saying that the grace of God that was extended through Christ and his suffering on the cross is insufficient to forgive you? How dare you think that your sin has such a deep stain that God's grace can't wash it free? I want to bring the Apostle Paul into this conversation. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13, Paul says to his spiritual son Timothy, in the past, I insulted Christ. As a proud and violent man, I persecuted his, his people. But God gave me mercy because I did not know what I was doing. I did that before I became a believer. But our Lord gave me a full measure of his grace. And with that grace came the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Paul is saying to us, Grace defeated shame in my life. He's saying, if you would have known me before I met Christ, I, I was a violent man. I, I was an angry man. I insulted Christ. I persecuted his people. But when I gave my heart to Christ, he not only washed away my sin, he washed away the stain of shame. So I'm not bound up by what I used to be and how I used to behave and how I used to act. God's grace washed me. I 
I remember this pastor talked about a young lady in his church that used to be a prostitute before she came to faith in Christ. A young man in the congregation fell in love with her. And he asked her to marry him. And she said, I I can't. I can't marry you because you don't know what I used to do. You don't know how I used to live. You don't know how I used to behave. You don't know how how my body has been so used for the sexual pleasures of men. I'm not good enough for you. And she sat with the pastor to tell him what was going on. And he counseled her. He said, look, if this young man recognizes where you've come from, and he recognizes God's forgiveness of you and God's grace that's been extended to you for you to become one of his daughters, and he wants to marry you, how dare you turn down that request to to, to be married to him thinking that you don't deserve it. Grace is God's empowering presence that enables you to be what God's called you to be and to do what God's called you to do. I want you to see what the grace of God's all about. As one of the ladies in our congregation, she has this ministry where she reaches out to people on drugs and prostitutes and in some of the urban centers of New Jersey. And and when we had our satellite service in Montclair, right before COVID, she would come to me almost every Saturday and says, Pastor, will you pray with me about this person? And and, and, and every Saturday, she said, I want you to pray for Kimberly. And after every, every Saturday, the same prayer request, I got tired of praying for Kimberly. And I remember on a Sunday, we're in Rockaway. And after the service, she comes up to me. And she says, Pastor, may I introduce you to Kimberly? And every week when I see Kimberly, my heart just, it leaps with joy to see that grace, God's grace, can reach into every strat of society and pull someone out of the dirt and the grime and the grit and the mess of life and wash them free so that they would see and experience this sense of it's undeserved kindness that God's given. And may I suggest that there's some people in your life that if you would extend to them grace, you don't know what they will become. You don't know what they'll be able to accomplish. Because when you allow God to use you, that they experience God's grace through you, it defeats shame from off of them. It lets them get free from the prison sentence of shame. Ladies and gentlemen, one of the most powerful things you can ever do is extend undeserved kindness to people. Let me bring you back to the text. In verse 10 of John 8, Scripture says, Jesus straightened up and asked her, Woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir, she said. Then neither do I condemn you, Jesus declared. Go now and leave your life of sin. We've learned that grace triumphs over judgment, that grace defeats shame. May I offer you this third lesson from the text? Grace inspires change. Jesus extended grace to this woman that was certainly undeserving. And it did something in her. It inspired change. She was transformed. She became a Christ follower. She experienced God's forgiveness. She experienced God's redemption. John Piper, author and pastor, brings out this point that we must not overlook. Grace is not simple leniency when we've sinned. Grace is the enabling gift of God not to sin. Grace is power not just pardon. See, in reality, the religious leaders think that, hey, if I extend grace, I'm just giving people a pass to keep living wayward and ungodly. 
They couldn't see that grace empowers them to correct their behavior. Grace inspires them to change. Grace transformed them from what they used to be to what they can become because of God's empowering presence. Jesus used truth as a bridge and not as a barrier. And I want you to see what truth is meant to do and meant to be. Jesus said to her, go now and sin no more, which means you can still hit God's mark with your life. Keep trying. Truth mixed with grace, it provides a liberating effect. Grace inspired change. She was changed that very day. Can you imagine when she was, she's walking home? No crowd throwing stones at her. No one mocking her. As she's walking home, that morning air, it, 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 it felt different. As the sun was Coming up, the rays seemed brighter. As she walked home, the sweetness of Jesus' words, it rang in her ear and rang throughout her soul. She felt different. She knew that day I didn't experience condemnation, though I was deserving of it. I experienced grace, though I was undeserving of that. That day, she was changed. That day, she went home knowing that I'll never be the same again. I will not look for love in ways that are destructive. I will look for love in ways that are constructive. That day she felt worthy to be loved in a righteous way because she served a God who extended grace to her. Question, who in your life needs your grace. And what is God calling you to do today that says life when you apply grace can be messy. It's not as clean cut, cut and dry, black and white as truth. But when you apply truth and grace together, you got to roll up your sleeves and work through all of the mess and be willing to say, even though that person is undeserving of kindness because God has extended grace to me, I'm going to then be a funnel that I can extend grace to others. I want to pray with you today about God's amazing grace working in you and through you so we can see a better world. Would you stand together with me, please? And I want to have some special personal ministry for individuals that in your heart you're saying, Pastor, I feel like I'm a prisoner of shame. I have been handcuffed to shame and guilt of my past. Whether it's distant past or recent past, shame, it's, been, it's a stranglehold around your neck. If that's you, come and gather here at the altar. I want the Holy Spirit to come and break that stranglehold of shame over your life and inject grace into you. Come on, wherever you are. Yeah. Come, sir. Come, ma'am. I don't know what may have happened in your past, whether it was childhood, whether it's adulthood, but I want you to come. And don't you be embarrassed. I don't care what may have transpired, how difficult. The Lord is here, and He loves you. See, I'm talking to you if you walk around feeling bad about who you are. God has a better way. And God wants you to know His grace is undeserved kindness. God wants to change you. Aren't we thankful to the Lord how He loves us, how He cares for us? Yeah. As you're here at the altar, I want you to know that you can't buy grace. You can't beg for grace. You can't barter for grace. You can only receive grace because it's a free gift. And so I want to pray over you. Father, I thank you so much for these tremendous men and women as they stand here. I ask that you chip away at every experience and emotion 
that generated shame in their lives. I pray that you wash them free, Lord, from whatever may have happened. Wash them free from those images that try to keep them ensnared and imprisoned to shame and guilt. I, fr I pray that the words that may, be, may have been spoken over their lives that induce that negative feeling about themselves, break those words, break the back of shame over them and fill them with grace, fill them with this sense that I'm, I, I deserve, I deserve to be healed. I welcome my healing from God. I thank you, Lord, that you set them free, that they may become all that you've called them to become and that they may be able to do all that you've called them to do. Use them. May they experience and accept the gifts you've given them, creativity, wisdom, insight. May they accept their uniqueness of personality. I pray that their family life and family dynamic will change from this day forward. Lord, do it for each one. In the name of Jesus. Do it, Lord. Each one. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now I'm going to ask for some courageous people to admit something today so you can get help from God. You have a tough time giving grace to others. It's tough. Because what happens is that it fills your mind. You say, man, they, they don't deserve this. And if that's you, would you raise your hand right where you are? I want to pray that the Lord just melts that. That helps you. God gives you this sense. He, he tenderizes your heart so you'll know how to be able to dispense grace without struggling so much. Father, I thank you for all these hands that are raised. They're admitting that they see themselves and they recognize the need to grow in their ability to give grace to others. I pray, Lord, that you would cause them to be able to extend this undeserved kindness to family members and people that they come across with in terms of uh, on the job or in their schools, in the community, in the church. Lord, thank you that you tenderize their hearts. In fact, Lord, I pray not only for them, I pray for all of us. Tenderize all of our hearts, Lord, that we may be great, great conduits of grace to others. In Jesus' name. And with our head bowed, our eyes closed, if you've never before invited Jesus into your life to be your Savior, I want to invite you and introduce you to meet Jesus, to experience Him, to invite Him into your heart to be your Savior. So quietly in your heart, repeat after me these words. Heavenly Father, come into my heart today in the person of Jesus. Wash away my sins. Change me. And help me to walk with you every day of my life, starting right now. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.